Okay, so here we go again to continue our lesson on uh, crises and crashes. Uh, I forgot to say that one of the biggest orangeries is in Versailles, uh, with 3,000 uh, orange trees in the uh, orange trees of the Chateau de Versailles. So, uh, you've seen the film on tulip mania uh, and crazy prices just for a bulb. And we're just going to, uh, before starting here, look at the difference between investment, a market, and speculation. We need marketplaces. For example, uh, the corn market, where you're going to be buying cereals. Uh, you need to know what the price is being offered uh, for, for the seller, for the buyer. But when you're buying something to use it, you're buying corn to make bread. Uh, that is a normal market. Speculation is when you're not interested in the object itself, you're interested in buying it to resell to make a profit. That's speculation. Now, in the days of tulip mania, of course, buying bulbs or buying shares, donc les actions pour les Français, buying shares took a long time. You needed a stockbroker, you needed to go to the bank probably to borrow the money. Uh, so it was a long process. Nowadays, as you can see on the video, uh, speed, high-speed trading, computers do the trading. It's done in nanoseconds. As I've said to you before in class, most purchases and sales of commodities, of, of uh, currencies, of shares, the average time between buying and selling is seven seconds. This is not investment. This is pure speculation. How, therefore, do you decide what the value of something is, like a share? Um, if you're buying shares in, in uh, Apple or Facebook or Volkswagen, what do you look at in terms of is the, is the share price a good deal or not? First of all, you can look at the profits of the company. What are the profits that company is making? What are the dividends it's going to pay back to the shareholders? The second thing you look are, uh, at are the assets. What has the company got in assets in terms of uh, factories, in terms of buildings, uh, things that it can actually sell? For example, Facebook probably doesn't have very much in terms of assets. It has a system that is very popular with millions of people. Volkswagen has got factories, it's got machines, it's got a uh, workforce, uh, so it's asset value is, is, is uh, much, uh, much higher. Uh, so uh, now we're going to look at, we're going to start with tulip mania and we're going to go on uh, to the subprimes crisis. So this was the, the film that we saw, uh, tulip mania, and you can see it takes a certain amount of time. And here we're starting in 1634. Prices start going up. 1636, people start getting very excited and start not only using their wealth, but borrowing money. Speculation comes very often when you've got too much money at the top, a lot of spare liquidity floating around to be invested. But also, people jump on the bandwagon. They haven't got enough of their own money to buy, so they go to the banks. The banks lend them the money. The banks lend more than they have, that's called leverage, uh, and people start borrowing money from the banks in order to buy the bulbs to speculate. They then use the value of the bulbs that they have. They can say, look, the bulbs I've got here are worth uh, a million um, florins, and you use that as um, uh, like capital to borrow even more money. So the whole thing goes crazy, and you can see suddenly the spike goes up really fast, and it's very difficult not to get excited about being able to make quick and easy money. And then, suddenly, the bubble bursts, and you can see it comes down very quickly from, uh, from 60 uh, guilders down to uh, 10 cents. Bang! And if you were... Uh, if you had borrowed money from the bank, you now can't pay the bank back. The banks go bankrupt, <clears throat> people go bankrupt, and they lose everything that they had. So that was so we use tulip mania or tulipomania to refer to any speculative bubble. We had other bubbles. We're very bad at learning from uh, from history. 
we had the South Sea Bubble in 1720. The South Sea Company um, lent money to the government to get the government out of debt in order to have a state monopoly on doing trade uh, with the, the, the South Seas. And the problem was for people buying the shares, they couldn't see the assets. They knew that there was this trade going on, uh, but they didn't know what the assets actually were. And we can see, again, it, it's a bit quicker now. The share value, 1720, is 128 in January, up to £1,000 by August, and bang, September down to 150. So now we can see that the bubble uh, burst, the whole process is a bit faster. Let's move on. We've now got Black Thursday, 1929, the Wall Street crash. We're going to take a, a, a deeper look at the Wall Street crash later on. It's often known as Black Thursday, but the Wall Street crash didn't happen in a day. It's a period of several weeks that it took. And uh, we can see the... I've got two pictures here. One of the... Um, uh, Black Thursday, the Wall Street crash, and the next one of Tuesday, September the 30th, 2008, which was the big crash. The, again, the subprime crisis took several months, uh, but we tend to think of it happening uh, very fast. So, what were the causes of these crises? They're the same each time. We've got, first of all, easy credit. Banks, happy to lend money, banks lending much more than they've got uh, in their own resources, the removal of controls, uh, and we're going to see that after the Wall Street crisis, the first action that Roosevelt took when Roosevelt was elected, uh, at the, after the Wall Street crash, the Great Depression, Roosevelt elected in 1932, the first thing he did, bank holiday, close the banks down, regulate banking with the Glass-Steagall Act. And you might think, well, if Roosevelt regulated the banks, why did we have the subprimes crash? Because under pressure from the banks, uh, Clinton removed the, uh, the controls, uh, Bush removed them even more, and suddenly the banks were able to speculate uh, once again. 1929, speculation led to uh, values going up by 400%, and share prices didn't reflect the real value. No one spent time to think, what is the real value, either in terms of profits or in terms of um, infrastructure of these companies. Everyone was simply interested in buying to resell to make a quick buck. Banks had lent beyond their resources through leverage, and once again, this is where you come back to regulations. What is the leverage allowed for a bank? Uh, we can see in the subprimes crisis that banks, the leverage was um, between 35 and 40. Uh, in other words, for every one dollar they had, they were lending 35 to 40 dollars. You only need a few people not to be able to pay you back, and you're in trouble. And this then meant by 1933 we had 25% unemployment. One of the things we can see regularly in crisis, we're, we're going to see it in, in the current uh, health crisis at the same time, private profit public debt. The governments often bail out the banks if they can, they try to save them. When the banks are making profits, they're making ridiculously high amounts of, of, of money for the managers. And then who has to pay for it all in the end when the government gets in debt? It's the people. If you take France, after the subprimes crisis of 2008, Europe is still suffering the debt crisis related to that 2008 uh, subprimes crisis. Uh, so France's debt was already 100% of GDP. Remember the Maastricht criteria say that it should be a maximum of 60% to be able to cover your debt. And... Uh, with the COVID-19, we're now going to go France and other European countries even further into debt. What is the solution going to be? I hope they don't have the same solutions they had post-2008, uh, which didn't work. Let's move on. So here we have a cartoon. We've got the uh, Wall Street banker. Uh, and he's just fallen through the roof. In other words, the crash has happened. And 
he says, well, that's it, uh, we've hit bottom, and you can see the saw going to cut the uh, ground from, from under him because it hasn't uh, finished yet. So what is interesting, what we can learn from history is how to deal uh, with crisis. What do you do when you start getting into a debt spiral? Banks are going bust, so the interbank lending system breaks down. We've then got government debt, we have private debt, and we can get into a negative cycle of a debt crisis. How do you rebuild an economy? Well, we can see uh, in the New Deal that uh, Roosevelt used Keynes's ideas, and we had a conflict of economic paradigms or political paradigms. After the crisis, 25% of the population unemployed. Uh, soup kitchens, uh, food banks for the poor. There's no safety net in those days. There's no unemployment benefits. There's no social security. There's no free health. And so it was pretty desperate times. What do you do to restore the economy? The American people, we're going to see, had two choices. They had Hoover, the ex-president, who said, we need an austerity plan. Why? Because in a depression, the government is earning less money, the fiscal, uh, the tax is coming into the government, going down. People unemployed. Uh, companies not making profits. Therefore, your tax revenues go down. So, the typically and incorrect solution is an austerity plan. The government should spend less. What happens? They reduce the wages of the civil servants, they reduce public spending, which makes the system even worse. Exactly what we've done in Europe after 2008. Or, they had a choice with Roosevelt. And Roosevelt, he communicated with Keynes. Roosevelt wouldn't admit that he was a Keynesian, but they communicated together. Keynes criticised Roosevelt for not doing enough, but what Roosevelt did do was provide security. And we'll come back to that when we look uh, at the New Deal. Black Wednesday, 1992. This was uh, an attack on the pound. This was a speculative currency attack. This is uh, Gordon Brown, the head of the Treasury, uh, on the right with his uh, head in his hands as the crash happens. And on the left, you have George Soros, the most famous currency speculator. The UK was in the European rate mechanism. That's, we talked about that. That's the European snake. It meant you had to tie your currency to the other currencies, with uh, the idea of, in the end, uh, this is the same mechanism to join the euro uh, later on. George Soros made £1 billion, the Bank of England lost £3.3 .3 billion. Uh, why did it happen? What happened? First of all, George Soros has been acquiring pounds over a long time. He starts selling pounds, which puts a lot of pounds onto the market, so there's more supply than demand, so the, the value of the pound starts falling. The Bank of England knows it has to keep the value of the pound within the European rate mechanism. So what does it do? It uses its reserve currencies to buy pounds. So then you have a battle. Who's going to win? Can Soros sell enough pounds to make the pound crash? Or has the Bank of England got enough uh, currency reserves in dollars, in yen, to buy pounds and win the battle? George Soros wasn't on his own. George Soros made it publicly known to the other traders, George is selling. George is selling pounds. So everyone knows George Soros is the biggest trader. They jump on the bandwagon and everyone understands this is a speculative currency attack and they all start selling pounds. Bank of England desperately using all its reserves it has none left. It uses all its foreign currency to buy pounds. It runs out and the pound collapses. And unfortunately, this was just at the moment when I was transferring uh, money from Portugal, from my company, uh, into pounds. 
uh, and it cost me a lot of money. So if I ever see George Soros, I'll ask him for some money back. Um, the, the Bank of England could have made a £2.4 uh, billion pound profit if it, had, if it had decided to allow the, the pound to crash and hadn't used its foreign reserves. How does George Soros make his money? Uh, he, the pound crashes, and then he's got lots of foreign currency, which he uses to buy the pound when the pound is at a very low level, and the pound bounces back, and he makes, makes a billion pounds in about a week. That's pretty good. A billion pounds in a week is, is, is pretty good. So this is currency speculation, Black Wednesday. The subprimes crisis. Now, I think we did a little sketch in class about the subprimes crisis, but just to remind you uh, what happened. Subprime means not top. If you want a prime piece of meat, it's the best meat. Subprime means it's not so good. So a subprime crisis was basically the banks lending money to people who were not the best people to pay it back. These were called the ninjas. No income, no job, no assets. So uh, how does it work? The, this started at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008. The banks needed to lend more money, but the trouble was people who wanted to borrow money had already borrowed money. So the banks said, OK, we will sell to the subprimes. But we know that they won't be able to pay the money back, probably. So this is what we do. The traders go out and sell uh, uh, mortgages to poor people, saying, here you go, $200,000 to buy your house. Um, and uh, it doesn't, you know, don't worry. Because the housing market always rises, if you have difficulty paying it back, um, then it's not a problem because you can sell your house and still make a profit. The traders know that this is wrong. They get their money free from each document signed. Um, so this is called no document lending based on increasing house values. So the ninjas, they also have very attractive interest rates at the beginning. If you sign now, you get a specially cheap interest rate. They don't read the small print, which explains that the interest rate is linked to the interbank lending rate and is variable and the higher interest rates are going to kick in later on. Uh, so now the banks have lent money to people who are unlikely to pay it back. So what have they got? They've got to now get rid of this, what we would call polluted debt. They need to sell it off. So what they do is they cut it up, they make um, different mixtures of high risk, medium risk and low risk and they call them by fancy names. I've put here A bonds, B bonds, C bonds with different levels of risk and the, the banks have fancy names and this looks very attractive. If you want to invest and you say, oh the banks have got um, uh, double uh, gold bonds uh, earning 5-6%, it's good interest, you think that looks good. What do I do? How do I know if it's safe? I go to a rating agency to see if it's safe. And the rating agencies, they, do not, they haven't done their job. They don't understand the scheme. They give it triple A. And so therefore, people like the Icelandic banks and other banks around the world, pension funds, they buy into these subprimes uh, without knowing that they're subprime. Uh, and they get their fingers burned. So the borrower, once the interest rates kick in, the borrowers can't repay their debts. So then the bank or the owner, the new owner of the debt, takes over the house, takes over that credit. But suddenly the, there are too many houses on the market at the same time. So the house prices collapse. And the whole credit system was based on a rising uh, housing market. So if the the value of houses starts going down, the basis of all that credit starts going collapsing. So other householders who were potentially good to repay their debt, suddenly they're borrowing, they're paying a debt for a house that is now worth much less than the money they borrowed for. 
uh, so they also get out of their uh, out of their mortgage and then bankers desperately try and sell off uh, this uh, polluted debt. So what are the causes of all of these uh, crises, these economic crises? Human greed. If you look at tulips, people weren't buying tulips in the middle of the crisis in order to plant those tulips, they were buying them to make a profit. This is trading. And trading, we can see it in everything. We can, we can look uh, at another example in 2004. The United States decided to take 25% of its export grain off the market in order to start making biofuel. Now, it's very simple maths. If, if suddenly the supply goes down because the USA is taking that off the food market, taking that grain off the food market, then the price is going to go up. The price should have gone up by 5%. But these are economic graphs that never work. And what happened, the price in 2004 of grain, of sweet corn, went up by 100%, leading to food riots around the world as people couldn't feed their kids because people were speculating in cereals. Easy credit. When the interest rate is very low, this leads people to borrow money to invest. So, for example, when the interest, what we saw um, the housing market in Ireland, in Spain, in Portugal, the interest rates were very low in the Eurozone. They were low in order to create consumption. And one of the first things you do is create, start building houses because the housing market is normally in, increasing in value. You borrow money at 1%. I've now had publicity in my letterbox to borrow money uh, over uh, 12 months or, or 24 months. Uh, yeah, thousands, tens of thousands of euros for less than 1%. So if you can borrow money cheaply, you then build a second house, knowing the value of the second house will go up, you rent out your second house. So low interest rates encourage speculation. Also, if the interest rate was high, you wouldn't necessarily speculate, you could simply leave your money in the bank to make a normal interest rate. Few controls. Why were the banks in the subprimes crisis able to sell on the mortgages that they had signed? Um, they knew that this was, the, the, this was polluted credit. They shouldn't have been allowed. If, they could, if a bank had to hold on to the mortgage it signed with people, they would never have sold them to the ninjas. The speed of transaction, 75% of trading is now carried out by computers, not by people. And the computers are using algorithms. The algorithms simply follow the market. So we lose a sense of, of, of uh, uh, human intelligence behind the trading system. The complexity of funds uh, is very difficult. Like in the subprimes, people didn't really know what was behind the funds that they were buying into. And the capital and debt ratio, this is the, basically the leverage that banks are allowed to use in order to lend money that they don't actually have. Deregulation and the difficulty to regulate. Money has political power. That's why the banks managed to deregulate, to remove the Glass-Steagall Act put in by Roosevelt. So deregulation, they say, don't tie our hands, uh, allow us to trade and then you deregulate and that creates uh, the potential for crisis. Globalization, liberalization, money can now go in and out of countries, of sectors, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, the money is not there to invest for a long term uh, into production, uh, into industry. It's there to make a quick buck. And now the fact that money can fly around so fast in global terms is another uh, problem. And the, the people expecting to make 10 to 20 percent profit, well if growth is around 2 percent uh, in Europe, 2 percent would be quite good now, we'd be very happy with 2 percent. Um, if growth is at 2 percent, how can you make 20 percent uh, by speculating? Then you're going to have winners and losers. And a remuneration system for banks, the banks are under pressure to make money for their shareholders. The banks are doing their jobs within the legal system that is offered to them. So you can't just blame the banks for doing their jobs. You can blame the whole capitalist system, if you like, for speculation. 
Also, traders make money from fluctuation, not from stability. The current fluctuations in the, in the stock market um, due to the, uh, the coronavirus is very good for trading. Yes, you might think, well, that's bad for trading because the stock market is collapsing. If you're a trader and you know what you're doing, you're in there to make money and you'll see the values going down, bouncing back, going down, bouncing back. You and I, we wouldn't be able to deal with that. We would probably lose a lot of money. But traders make money from fluctuations. If the economy is extremely stable and prices are stable, there's no, it's more difficult for traders to make money. If the banks know they're going to be saved because they're too big to fail, then they take risks because they think, well, the government is going to save us. So these are the same people saying, we don't want big government, we want small government, until they're in trouble. And then, uh, like Ford Motors, like the banks, they say, please bail us out. When the 2008 crisis happened, I was happy. I thought, this is going to be so big, uh, so global, that the world is going to have to rethink how the economy works. We were in a Bretton Woods system from 1944, then Bretton Woods broke down once Nixon pulled out of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which controlled the value of the dollar to, to gold and stabilized all the currencies. Um, and we haven't created new global rules about how to control crises. Um, so would we see, I thought, we'll see a new Bretton Woods. Uh, we're going to find the source of the problems of speculation. Have we done anything no, I think Iceland is the only place where anyone was put into prison for speculation. The corp people who caused it in the USA, I don't think uh, they suffered at all. The frequency of crises is increasing, the rapidity is increasing, and the effect is now worldwide. You can see in the health crisis at the moment, suddenly we're waking up and realizing that the disinvestment in national health is a problem. The fact that our masks or our medicine is made in another country and China is a problem. So maybe we will wake up and realize that globalization uh, has structural weaknesses uh, in it. And is the health industry a private business that should be there to, to make profits? Well, many countries, if you look at the crisis of Italy, of what's going to arrive in the UK, of what is happening in France, the Disinvestment in the public services of health uh, is going to be seen very hard. An army isn't there to make a profit. An army is being paid to be ready for a war. Well, uh, the president of France, Macron, said this is a war. Okay, where's our army? Well, we haven't got one. Where are their weapons? Well, we sold them. So this is a. So maybe we will rethink uh, after this current health crisis how the system works. Solutions. Well, go back to the Glass-Steagall Act. Separate uh, banks that do normal commercial business from banks that are involved in speculation. Ban tax havens. We talk about it a lot. There's a lot of rhetoric and no action in terms of tax havens that exist around the world of shell companies um, which uh, promote a sort of corrupt uh, speculative system. Uh, for capital funds, for banks, capital fund levels, the Cook um, um, recommended uh, a ratio of 8% in terms of the capital that a bank has in terms of how much it can lend. We need regulations concerning that. Tax purchasing, tax speculation. Why should we pay taxes when we buy a bicycle or, or, or uh, a guitar? And yet speculation is paying no taxes. So the idea of a financial transfer tax, in other words, taxing speculation, would do two things. It would provide an enormous amount of money. We have money. It's, it's just it's in the wrong place at the moment. It would make money available for investment in real things that we need, like health systems, like infrastructure, like education. Um, and, the, and it would slow down the system. If, if you can make money by making a profit of 0.001% because you're doing it every, every few seconds, so you're dealing with big amounts of money very often, um, 
then suddenly if you have a 1% tax, a Tobin tax was suggested at 0.05% to 1%, I would, I would not have anything less than 1% if it was me, to suddenly uh, you slow the speculation down because you don't make a profit until you've made 1%. Change the bonus system of banks to long-term profit, not to making short-term uh, profit from highly risky ventures. Limit bonuses to the, to the bankers. When some of the banks were bailed out, the money didn't go into the system to provide money for the companies. It very often went to providing managers with bonuses for those same people that had created much of the problem. Uh, ban food commodity speculation. That's not too difficult uh, to do. If a purchaser is the final consumer, in other words, you order a thousand tons of grain, it turns up at your doorstep, then you've got a marketplace instead of speculation. And we need cooperation from a G7, a G8, a G20. Uh, the problem, as I said before, is the banking sector has a lot of political power and big industry has a lot of political power, but we need some sort of international agreement at the moment, the problem is if Europe says, well, we're going to have a financial transfers tax, then the banks say, well, all the trading is going to move to the United States. So we wait for the United States to do something. And they say the same thing. We wait for the US, uh, for the, uh, Europe to do something. So we need a global agreement, at least on financial transfers tax. So that's the end of this session. I uh, Don't forget, if you have any questions, send them to me by email, not to my ESCA email address. Use the two addresses on the contact site of my website.